And so included on this page is as current um, num as current numbers as I could find as far as the impact of of online networking and social networks. And I mean, it's it's pretty staggering. And the one thing that I like about this infographic is that it um, it really kind of lays it out in an interesting way that at this point in the game we have 1.55 billion active users on Facebook. So the difference, between, the difference between an active user and just someone who has an account is an active user somebody who's actually using it. We sign up for a lot of accounts and a lot of us never use those accounts. So these numbers are supposed to be active monthly users. Okay, so there's one and a half, over one and a half billion active users of Facebook. And this, the neat statistic that they use in this in infographic is that if Facebook was a country, it would be the most populated country in the world. Ahead of China and India, right? What happened to MySpace? Um, That's so sad. Well, MySpace was a little groovy, right? I loved it. How, so, you were, so you had a MySpace. How old were you when you had a MySpace? When I first got one. Yeah. We got them in middle school. Okay. I would say like eighth grade, everybody. How old are you now? Sorry. If it's, 25. Okay, so 25. Did, <laughs> Okay, so that that's kind of right, yeah, right in the wheelhouse there of we were of MySpace, the right? And then once we got into college, everybody had a Facebook, and Facebook was like the thing to do. It was really interesting back back when um, Facebook and MySpace were kind of duking it out for for kind of the so the the social network, because um, you know everything's everything's driven by dollars. So you know they were duking it out, and it was really interesting that there were some interesting articles coming out in educational journals about um, the the digital divide and how you know the the way that people interacted online and the websites they used said a lot about culture. And um, there was this interesting thing about MySpace being a digital ghetto. The people that were using MySpace were you know were people that you know in your head you think about ghettos there were there were there were people that you know were kind of ghetto right and then in facebook it was you know uh they were adult more you know more adults more middle class and upper class and so it it became this kind of interesting kind of digital ghetto and what why myspace died was because that prevalence drove all of the uh, advertising dollars to Facebook. And basically, that's what killed MySpace, was the fact that, you know, the, that people that were more affluent and, and higher up in, this, in the kind of social, uh, socioeconomic stratosphere uh, were all on Facebook. So that's why Facebook is a multi-billion dollar corporation and MySpace um, doesn't exist anymore. Um, but what did you say, though? Well, but they're it, yeah, but they they're bringing it back not as a social network, but really as a uh, like a music yeah, right? Yeah. Why would you say Facebook? It's, they're the same thing. Well, they're almost like the, you know what? The thing, the thing. I think one of the big difference between Facebook and MySpace was that um, I think that that kids gravitated toward MySpace first, and not to Facebook. And so it was basically kind of driven by a, a, a youth culture. And so it, it in, a, a, in appearance, it took that on. You could actually manipulate your, your background so it was all, you know, kind of blinged out or it had, you know, yeah, so you could drop, you could, you could code stuff behind it. You could manipulate it a lot. And so, and so it, it looked like, you know, the kids who were, participating in MySpace and um, it so so you had like you know wallpapers behind your your stream that were like rappers and that were like you know scantily clad women and you know that kind of stuff and it just so so as so as an adult 12 years ago or whenever you know this they, they were kind of here you know I, I got on MySpace and instantly felt kind of skeevy for being on MySpace you know and Facebook is, you know, clean white background, 
you know, it you, it doesn't look like anything. And then all of a sudden, and then all of a sudden, Facebook kind of became the place where adults were, and MySpace was where kids were, and you know. And look at pictures, she sure. Never had MySpace. Yeah. Like back in the day, yep. my mom got a Facebook, and my mom barely knows how to look at a cell phone. And she has a Facebook to like look at pictures. Sure. But they never like that older the older culture would never be on MySpace back in the day. No. Like it was always you like the same young kids. It and was, and kids, like, and really the doll the dollar drives it. So where where you know where where is all the, where's who who has the most money to spend on things that are being advertised? Kids on MySpace or adults on Facebook, and you know, that's 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 where that kind of uh, that's where that really was born. And I remember those stat this, these stats back in the day that you know Facebook was a country; it would be the 19th most populated country in the world, and now it's it would be the most populated country in the world ahead of China and India. So one and a half billion people on Facebook. I mean, it's it's that that's crazy to me. The one and that that's not super startling to me. In a world with seven billion people, seven billion plus, that one and a half billion are on Facebook. That's not super surprising for me. The next one is the one that just is staggering: is YouTube. That they, that YouTube has a billion active users. These are people with accounts that upload, that share, that like. Not just people that I mean, we're, if 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 yeah, if people that used. YouTube that just that didn't have an account but just watched videos on it and didn't weren't active use and that aren't active users that number's way higher. If you have well, 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 we all have we all if you have a Google account, you have a YouTube account. Okay. Yeah. So if you any any kind of any kind of activity that you do in YouTube, if you subscribe to a channel, if you upload a video, you know you're that they consider you to be an active user. Okay. So that's. Yeah, but if you you know if you just go to if you just go to YouTube and look up you know uh, cheating at Monopoly and you don't have a you know you're not under your your account you're not you're not actively uh, participating in in it as a social network as a community then you're that don't, they would don't consider you an active How user. Old is, this, like, is this, new? this is um as of I think September two thousand fifteen. They're the most recent statistics I could find. Oh well, there like, it's right there at four hundred million. Four hundred million. Really? Yeah. Like, isn't it almost taking over from Facebook? No, no, not really. It's different. Yeah. It's just pictures. So. I bet YouTube is like huge with middle schoolers. Yeah. <laughs> huge. Well, you sure. Know, people have, like, <laughs> I, I listen. Yeah. Oh. Like I had a girl in high school that's a fashion blogger on YouTube, and she makes she pays her bills. Mm -hmm. Like she's making thousands of dollars off YouTube. I don't understand that, but. You don't. Does, does does anyone know how how you can make money off of YouTube? They pay them for, for every subscriber. Like she has like I think it's like a hundred a hundred thousand subscribers, and for every subscriber, she like and every like she makes money. But when you make that account with YouTube and you get that contract legally, they're not allowed to tell anybody like the exact amount, or else they lose their contract. And then she does endorsements, so all the different like beauty companies send her things, and she does an endorsement and then makes money off of it. Sure. Well, so here's here's this one, and I has has anyone watched any of this woman's videos before this one we just watched? Jenna Jenna Kingsley. I've I've never heard of her before now, but this video that she created has 1.2 and a half million views. Okay, and I there's a there's a threshold for views on on. YouTube and once you go past that threshold right you you can start monetizing because what what happens is is that um, YouTube plays those little ads before your videos unless you're kind of mean like me and you download a, you only watch YouTube in Google Chrome and you um, add an extension to Google Chrome called, called adblock YouTube that blocks those ads and by blocking ads, those people don't get the revenue for my view. But sorry, I hate I hate ads, right? So, um, but she's making money for views on YouTube. Okay, that I mean, it's it's she's got she's got over a million people watching her I video. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure exactly what that number is, but you know. She's got 119 here, 60,000 there, 
1,189 there. This is obviously her most popular video. Just kind of looking at 83,000. So she's, that social network in real life is, is a big one for her. Way bigger than subway pole dancers. Okay, so she's, you know, I don't, I don't know if she's making money, but there's, I mean, you know, the, the big money right now on YouTube is, is people like doing video game commentaries. They play a video game and then talk over it. The most, the, the, mo the richest guy from YouTube is named PewDiePie. That's his thing. And he makes millions of dollars a year uh, by just like commenting funny stuff over him playing video games on YouTube. And kids watch it. Okay. So YouTube, YouTube is a, a giant. It really, I mean, it's, it's insane how, how big YouTube is. And I mean, if anytime I'm, I need to repair something, fix something, build something, you know, create something there, it's, it's on YouTube, man. My, my air conditioning dies and I go to YouTube, type in the model number of, I, you know, find out exactly what model my thing is and say this, you know, my, this air conditioner, uh, you know, the, the air conditioner doesn't work. And then, um, you know, and I kind of give it the fans blowing, but no heat's coming out. Go to YouTube. It's this one little sensor in this one little place. And you repeat, you, you, replace that and it works and it's like a three dollar part that you get from the HVAC store that you know and there just happens to be one you know two miles from my house and I pick up this little part and I go in there and I take this thing out just like the little guy showing me on you you know the guy showing me on YouTube and I pull it out and take this one part out screw this apart in put it all back together boom my air conditioning works and it cost me three dollars and you know just a, a small amount of my time instead of paying an HVAC person to come out it's gonna hundred dollars minimum just to walk through the door and then you know that's it's it's crazy how much stuff you can how, what what you can find to fix on YouTube. Well, you know, it's the broad spectrum of YouTube. Like, I mean, there you can it's literally anything. I mean, I find some of some of you that said they left on a rock climbing for YouTube. Yeah, like with ropes and like, sure. like rock climbing rock climbing on you. I was like, how do you get into that? Like, you take a class because they um, rock climb top hill. Mm -hmm. And they were like, no, we just watch YouTube videos and there's practice. And I was like, no, there's like, <laughs> well, yeah, but they, you know, it's. Instead of taking hundreds of hours, it's all the Sure. Yeah, I mean, and, and so there are so many. This is, this is the hugest thing right here. And this is, if, you, um, if you've already watched uh, those videos from. From Tuesday, the one that Will Richardson is in the the TEDx one, and the his book that we're going to read, uh, Why School, um, YouTube, and and why YouTube is is um, has just amazing implications for not only school but is, but learning, is that YouTube is a place for teachers and for learning, not teachers like I got my teacher credential and I'm a teacher. There are millions of teachers on YouTube. Okay. And some of them are like 12 years old. Okay. The, some of them are, I mean, honestly, uh, the when that first dawned on me, a buddy of mine uh, had a, uh, a one of these, but the old one that wasn't chrome that was white, an iMac, one of those white iMacs. And it, it was a friend of his and it died and she wanted the hard drive out of it. And it's like, um, so how do you crack into one of these IMAX or they're like hermetically sealed and you know, they wanted to be able to take the hard drive out of it, diagnose the hard drive and put it back in, which if you had a PC, a tower, like the kind that's down here, you can just, you just unscrew things and yank the hard drive out and it's super easy. But with a Mac, it's insanely challenging if you want to preserve the Mac and use it again, or to try and diagnose something that's wrong with it. And so, um, check, went on YouTube. And there was a, a like a twelve year old British boy who showed us exactly how to do it. And he was so precocious and so cute, he had a little crooked tooth in the front of his face. And he step by step took us through dismantling an iMac and putting it back together. And so here we were, you know, two late guys in their late thirties 
trying to figure this thing out and couldn't. And so we enlisted the assistance of a teacher on YouTube, in which case he was the teacher and we were the learners, right? And he taught us how to do something that we didn't know how to do prior to that, you know? Is there like a legal right, like for kids making money and stuff on that? I don't know that he was, I mean, this is, I, I, this might even be back, I mean, back in the days before you could monetize it, I don't even know. But, I, and I don't know the, the laws and the rules regarding that. I know that, you know, that, that kids do it. I doubt it. I doubt yeah. if there's, I mean, I'm sure that there's some kind of, as much of a law as there is against, you know, kids acting in movies and that kind of stuff, you know, there's like child labor laws that have to be, you know, dealt with. But really, I mean, it's, so, so the idea that if a kid wants to learn something, they don't need us. It, YouTube is a technology that is what um, we like to that what is called in the in in this uh, this day and age a disruptive innovation. Okay, there's an author named Clayton Christensen, and he has a. His 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 theory in business is on theory of disruptive innovation, and he, along with another guy I don't remember his name off the top of my head, wrote a book called Disrupting School. Oh, it's not school; it's class. Sorry. Okay, a book called Disrupting Class. And this book is, is about the idea that disruptive innovation will change the way the world learns. And there's no doubt to that fact. Here's, here's, the, here's the, the cruddy truth, is that middle schoolers don't wanna learn science, they don't want to learn history, they don't want to learn how to write, they don't want to learn how to how to read critically, they don't want to, you know, they don't want to learn that stuff. Okay, so the things that we are imbued with as teachers to teach kids, they don't want to learn that stuff. There are too many things out there now that they want to learn that they have access to and can learn. So as teachers, right, how do we compete with that? Right? How do I compete? How do I, as a, let's say I'm a middle school history teacher, right? How do, how do I make, you know, the War of 1812 relevant to a kid who wants to watch a two hour video on YouTube about how to beat the dungeon on this particular video game? I can't compete with that. I'm not as good a teacher. I'm not as compelling a teacher. And my content certainly isn't as compelling as what that kid wants to learn and can learn at you know on his phone on his iPad on his computer on his TV right so how am i supposed to be able to compete with that part of that was like that's part of the you know what you those of you that went through five, um EDC 514 right you have to become a you have to create your own videos you know to try and compete and still you're not competing right that's the question, like right? What, like, at what point is it going to change? Well, the kids aren't going to change, right? This is only going to become more and more and more ubiquitous. It's only going to get in the hands of more and more and more kids, right? I mean, half of my students... They have what they call Obama phones, which are free. They, the, the, the government now gives, gives people like low socioeconomic, especially in homeless culture, they give them free phones. They're out on the corners in downtown San Diego giving away phones. And they're not just like flip phones so that they can dial five numbers in case of emergency. They are given smartphones. I mean, they're not like top of the line smartphones, but they're smartphones that get YouTube, that get Facebook, that get Twitter, that get Vine, that get everything else. They're just a little Android phone. And they get free data and free calls. So even we're we're in a we're in a space now where even the poorest of us can have access to this kind of learning. This is a disruptive innovation. This is something that is completely blowing up the status quo. We are lucky enough as educators to live in a time that is probably the time of most the most violent change in education. Ever, ever, 
Okay, and we're right in the middle of it. We're not on. We're not at the beginning of it, and we're not on the on the other side. We are right in the middle of it. And education doesn't know what to do with itself. When I say education, I mean the institution of edu education. We don't know what to do with ourselves because teacher teacher training programs are still in the mode of, you know, here's your curriculum. You write a lesson plan. You enact that lesson plan. The kids do the things that are in your lesson plan, and then you test them or assess them on what your lesson what what they were supposed to learn okay and that is built on a model that is that was meant for a different generation than what we have right now okay so teacher education programs haven't they, they don't know what to do we're just we're going to train teachers the way we've always trained them lesson plans and curriculum and content so do you think the change when this generation now is, is uh, you know, I hope we, I hope we have it figured out before then. I hope that we're moving towards something that's different before then, because the information is, is everywhere. Okay, so it doesn't matter if I'm the foremost historian on, you know, on antiquities and on, you know, the Roman Empire and ancient history. And I am a teacher that is teaching students about, you know, the ancient world history. And it doesn't, doesn't matter that I know any of that stuff anymore. It, it just doesn't. Because kids, if kids want that information, they can find it. They can find it on, on YouTube. They can find it on the internet and writing. They can listen to podcasts. They can, there's all kinds of different ways that kids can adjust that information if they wanted it. Okay, but if, I, if I'm sitting in a classroom with 35 kids, zero out of 35 want, want to really know that stuff. Can we make it interesting for them? Sure. You know, absolutely. And that's part of, part of what we have to do as teachers now is we have to try really hard to make stuff that's not interesting to kids interesting to kids. Well, what's so hard about it is the time factor. Well, make a video on one lesson plan Sure. What are you gonna? Yeah, yeah. Are you gonna become? Like, you gonna become a Martin Scorsese and make video after video to try and engage in kids? That's it's super challenging. In five fourteen, that was the message. Was I know. Video for everything you do. Okay, well that's time consuming. Yeah, there's that's that's that's, that's, that's not the answer. Kids. That's like a, that's like um, that's. Are we talking about his interactive videos? Just anything. Just any any video. He spent like years. Sure. Years making these interactive videos that you go on and it shows the periodic table. They were really cool. Oh, yeah. But for a teacher, like, do you have years out of your own time? He was like, I stayed up every day till 5 a.m. working on these for years. Well, here's the... How are you supposed to do that? And still... And that was one video. And still you have to force kids to watch those videos. Yeah. They're not naturally going to gravitate to those videos. One of the coolest guys out there, one of my favorite guys on YouTube is... His name is Keith Hughes. He has a, a YouTube channel. He's a history teacher. He has a, a YouTube channel called Hip Hughes History. He's kind of a, a goofy hipster guy, and he's got his own YouTube channel, and it's full of all kinds of um, fantastic videos on all kinds of different elements of history. And, you know, here we go. The election of 1880 explained. This is four, he did this one four weeks ago. It's 12 minutes long. He uses these for his class. And so here's Keith Hughes. He's got kind of the, the back beat there. Hey guys, welcome to Hip Hughes History as we hit you up with another election. This time it's 1880. The Republicans have been in power for 20 years, and there's a big old vacancy over the front door of the White House because Rutherford B. Hayes is going to walk away after one term. So let's take a look at the candidates, let's take a look at the campaign issues, and of course we're going to take a look at that big old electoral map. So get up for the learning. That's what we got her done. <laughs> So groovy guy, right? And he's got you know he adds sound effects, brings in images. He's got his whole thing down. And it's really cool, right? If if I had a kid who was being tested on the uh, the election of 1880, I would say check out Keith Hughes. He's got a great 12 minute video on it. You can learn all you want there. But kids, he has to force his students to watch these. He's a he's a he has a flipped classroom, so he says, "Kids, uh, you're gonna go do this um, 
at, at home, this is your homework, is to watch this video, take notes, do whatever, come to class tomorrow and we're going to, you know, we're going to be doing something with that information. But he has to assign this work to his kids and I'm sure when his students go home, they're like, damn, another one of Hughes' videos I have to watch. And they kind of half watch it while they're on their phone, uh, you know, uh, Snapchatting or Vine or whatever they're doing on their phone while that's playing in the background. That's, that's, that's what the way kids operate. You know, he's, he's a U.S. history teacher, so we're talking about 11th grade kids, 16 and 17 year olds. Okay? As cool as this guy may seem or nerdy or whatever, as kitschy as his videos are, it's him standing here talking for 12 minutes. Okay? And that's, make, gives you that face. Kids make that face when they have to watch him. I just happened serendipitously there, right? So it's, we, we are dealing with crazy times right now, okay? It's discouraging. It's, it's, it's super challenging. This is not an easy job. It's not an easy job as it used to be where you could stand in the front of the classroom and have kids take out their books and do this and then they take, put those books away and they grab their other books and then they do that. It's, it doesn't work like that anymore. It, it does, unfortunately, but you have more and more kids that don't like school, okay? And they get through it because it's a means to an end, but they're not learning anything for the most part. You know, I haven't, my, my 11th grade son just, just got out of 11th grade. He's that prototype, um, AP kid, third in his class, you know, Kicks butt on every test. He took three years. He just finished with his third year of Spanish. And the other day he asked me, Dad, how, I mean, he's, he's like trying to say something. He's like, how do you say when in Spanish? I'm like, you just finished your third year of Spanish. How do you not know that when is cuando? How do you not know that? He's like, I'm done with that class. I don't need to know that anymore. It's a means, passing those classes, a means to an end. He's not learn. There's no learning. You learn it, and you guys know, you know the yeah. drill. You learn it so you can take the test, pass the test, do well on the test, and be done with it. I can't tell you one thing I learned in my undergrad. Can you tell me anything you learned in your undergraduate degree? A lot? <laughs> yeah. What was your degree? <laughs> but how about, how about your, how about your GE though? Your, your stuff that you had to take before you could take the stuff that you like? And, and guess what? Guess what? Now, if, if somebody asked you something from one of those, I mean, just not, not like, hey, remember that class you took? How about this piece of information? But let's say, um, so one of my undergrad classes that I had to take to, to, to graduate, it was the last semester of my, college, my, my undergrad. I had to take geology of our national parks and monuments. It was the only, it was the only science course available at the time that I needed to take a class. And so I took that class. And right now I couldn't tell you a damn thing I learned in that class. But if somebody asked me a question about some geological element of Yellowstone National Park, I would do what? Google. I would Google it, right? So the information that that class was supposed to imbue me with to make me a more well-rounded human being is now available right here. And if I need to know it, it's right here. Okay, so the idea of need to know for your future, this piece of discrete information, that piece of discrete information, it, it's archaic now. Okay? And as, some, as a teacher, right, that breaks my heart a little bit because I value the information that I know and can pass on to kids and my love of this and my, and my thoughts about that and these rich things that I am super interested in, you know? If you're a history major, you don't become a history major because you don't like history. You become a history major because you love elements of history and you want to share those with kids and you want them to treasure them the way that you do. And they don't. They learn if they if they're acing your class, they're they're learning that stuff, they're memorizing that stuff so they can pass a test and then they're forgetting it all. And do they know who Hitler is? Sure. And do they know what the Holocaust is? Yes. And do they know the American Revolution? Yeah. They know all that kind of basic stuff, but they're not remembering the minutia of what year this battle took place and who this traitor was and who that general was. And they, 
you know, that stuff just doesn't happen. And if they do know that stuff, it's because they watch Band of Brothers or they watch some TV show that really went in depth and they can connect visually and, you know, it's something that they're already interested in. But, you know, the idea that, you know, as an English major and a, form, and a former full-time English teacher, high school English teacher, 11th and 12th grade, my love for American literature, my love for Shakespeare, my love for, you know, that, that stuff is my, they're my loves, and I have students who have some of those same interests, but it's not necessarily because I taught them how to have that love or, you know, I want to introduce you to Shakespeare, you know, and that, you know, that might grab a kid's attention in that, but if they, if, if, you know, if, if that's something that they want to involve themselves in, they've got so many different avenues now to explore that, you know? And I, it, it, so it does, it, it, it's a little heartbreaking as a teacher that our role has changed significantly. It has to change more. I'm sure that in your teacher ed programs, you heard the whole sage on the stage and guide on the side thing, yes? Okay, that you can't stand at a podium and be the sage on the stage. You have to be go in with your students and be the guide on the side to kind of guide them through the, you know, through everything. And that's, that's, it's cliche and it's kind of trite. What it really is at this point is in an era where, where information is, is everywhere and kids have instant access to it, we're, we now have to become the kind of people who can help students figure out what to do with all this information. It's, it's just a different role now. Not, Swing back. Not, which not like, which way? I'm not meaning like technology is gonna be gone, but I mean like I mean kids. That's how they're raised is on an iPad. I mean health issues show it. Like the, children are not active anymore. They're on video games, iPads. Could we end up like a Wally -E society where everyone's everyone's floating around on on those like hover chairs and I mean. And, oh, I mean really though, like you ask the kids to go outside and play for twenty minutes, and it's like. Absolutely not. What am I do there's, you know, I, I think there have always been, you know, it's, it's in my lifetime, there's always been kids that stay inside all the time, and there have been kids that go outside all the time. There's, I, I think that it, it will to a certain degree, and that's why I think it's super important for schools never to lose, you know, the idea of physical education and, and getting kids outdoors. And now we're really, um, you know, what you, where you see the pendulum swinging back now is, is kids, you know, 20 years ago, they started tearing all the shop classes out of schools. Okay, because it was college for it was the college for everyone era, which you know, which really set you know our our country back insanely, and we're we're going to feel the repercussions of that for for you know another 10 to 20 years, because you know shop class those shop classes and trade classes and career and technical education classes those those provided kids who weren't who, who aren't, didn't want to go to college, it provided them with the opportunity to explore a lot of different things and find work, you know, find different work outside of that, you know, that college track. So what you're seeing now is, you know, the, all the shops that they tore out, they're not trying to put them back in because, you know, we need, we need to provide kids with other options besides, besides college. College is becoming more and more of just the word. I mean, I just, as a, as a, as a father of kid, of one student, one, one son who's in college, and I have, you know, another one that's going to be a senior, another one that's going to be a sophomore, and I'm like, you know, I, I really fear for my kids' futures because, you know, I'm a teacher. I can't, I can't spring for four years of college for any one of my kids, okay? I have a certain amount that I can pay for, you know, and then, then they'll, they'll have to decide, like, what, what college you're going to go to based on what I can give them. You know what I mean? And so my my eldest son, he decided that he wanted to go to Point Loma Nazarene, which, you know, is, it is yeah, it's $45,000 a year. And after a year and a half, he decided that, you know what, he didn't, he wasn't really, you know, feeling it there. So now he's $60,000 in debt as a 20-year-old guy, you know, and he's a musician, you know, he's, he's got, he wants to be a, he wants to be a worship leader. What does it take? What does it take a worship leader to, to make sixty thousand dollars? Like five years, you know? I mean, like he's sat for a year and a half of college. He's now saddled with this tremendous amount of debt, and the classes that he took there, besides his music classes, because he was a music composition major, but his his GE classes, they were stuffy professor in a classroom in a in a in a 
in a classroom, a theater classroom, you know, regurgitating his knowledge and kids were taking notes. It's like, how does, how is that going to help my son's future? You know what I mean? He, he's not going to have a job anywhere where he needs to sit and listen to some stuffy old guy regurgitate stuff and take notes on. That's just not, that's just not any part of a job that anyone's ever going to have, you know? And so we need to get real about like the, the role of college too. You know, it's, it's, it's a trip. I mean, you, you're, you're churning out educated debtors as in college, you know, seriously. I mean, the world just changed. I mean, high school, your general ed in college is this, this high school. Yeah. I mean, why not transfer, standard. why not go into your major directly out of well, high school? Because, you know, there's, it's, it's Saving money. money. Right. It's money for sure. Right. And so, money. and so it's, it's, we are like, and, and here's the thing. I can, I can, if I, if all I want is knowledge, if all I want to do is learn, heck, I, I can take one of hundreds of classes from MIT online for free. Do I get a degree from it? No. But is, you know, but did, should a degree matter? Or is, is learning what matters? It's, it, I, it is. In today's society, it's the degree. Oh, sure. It's yeah. The degree is where it's yeah. From. You can't, you can't put on your resume, I, you know, I, I took 14 MIT classes on experimental physics um, online, uh, you know, and, uh, but I just did it on my own. You know what I mean? That just, although I think more and more now, you kind of can. Right? If, if you're looking to, if you're looking to get into some, you know, into, into some field and you've educated yourself through free online classes from one of, Thousand of thousand different universities, Stanford, MIT, Harvard. They're all they all have free classes online, just there lectures. Yeah, but and you're still running into the issue of applications being online versus face to face. Oh sure. So you're not getting that interaction with. But I mean, the point is society's changing, okay? And school was originally created, and this uh, it, I this is uh something that that really connected with me uh, a ted talk by a guy named sugata mitra who is uh from india and has uh he developed a um uh, an experiment he called the uh, the computer in the wall the whole, it's a hole in a wall basically put a, a computer in a wall in a hole in a wall in in a in a slum in india and uh, just left it there put it at kid height so that kids would come become attracted to it and he found that kids taught themselves how to program to make that computer work on their own. And then he did the same thing. He took, took that same, that same paradigm. He took it out into one of the poorest villages in India. Did the same thing. And kids taught themselves computing with no teachers, with no, never having touched a keyboard before. You know, when they first saw it, they thought, you know, they thought it was, they had no idea what it was. And they taught themselves. You know what I mean? And it's like, he, he, he's, he's fascinating. And I'll maybe like, you guys have been looking at him the whole time behind me. Okay. Um, he, he uh, develops this idea that schools were created during the industrial, public schools were created during the Industrial Revolution, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And they were created with the rows and the instructions and the boss and the do this and get tested to create workers for factories. Okay. Those factory jobs are gone and there's a few, but those kinds of jobs are farmed out. Okay. Down and drones, yeah. Well, we'll see. I don't know about that. I think I think there are too many people with guns out there that will shoot drones down. Um, they'll have to figure that one out. But um, you know, those those jobs aren't the, the jobs that our uh, that our kids are going to be um, looking for. The, the employers are looking for people who can think critically, who can problem solve, who can collaborate, who can use a whole different skill set than what traditional school has has provided them with. And so we are, t we are teachers in this era where we are shifting. We have to shift from that, that, that kind of factory model to the collabor a collaborative model and a critical thinking model. 
where kids take information and do stuff with it. Where do you think that leaves Common Core? Com Common Core is fine. Common Core, Common Core gets a bad rap. I like it. But I, but I Common Core is Common Core is all about getting rid of discrete pieces of information and saying, here's information, do this with it. Yeah. The worksheets that they're churning out, especially for math in, in lower grades, make me want to punch babies because it's awful. When you when I have kids, I'm not literally going to punch babies. Okay. My, when my daughters would bring home their, their piercing common core worksheets, that, that, those are some of the worst hours of my life over the past five or six years. Those things are awful. Okay, the, I, they're just really bad. But the, 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 the common core standards, the actual standards, not the, not the curriculum that's, that's written and created by Pearson, but the standards are, are awesome. Because that's what they're asking you to do. They're asking you to take math and do this and that and the other with it. Take writing and do this, that, and the other. Take this reading and do, and do something with it. Not, you know, is this a noun, adjective, adverb, or, or in gerund? It's that they're not asking questions like that. Okay? Because if I want to know what a gerund is, I'll look it up online. If I want to know what the active past tense is, I'll look it up online. I don't need to drill kids. Like when I first became, when I first became a teacher and I was an English teacher, I was drilling kids on parts of speech and, you know, and just, and just frustrating them and frustrating me because, you know, they don't want to memorize that stuff. And, you know, and I don't know how to get them to want to memorize that stuff. So much so, do you guys remember Schoolhouse Rock, the Schoolhouse Rock videos? I had students making their own Schoolhouse Rock videos because that's how, that's how much I wanted to get them to want to know this stuff you know and it's you know it's 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 kind of pointless at this point because they can they can watch every single schoolhouse rock video on youtube if they want to to teach them how so it's right so here we are as as you know as teachers where tumblr which you know is does anybody over 25 on a tumblr right okay uh is anybody under 30 have a tumblr <laughs> The 550 million people on Tumblr. Tumblr is like a a, a, a visual, like a visual blog, you know. So you're not like writing, but it's pictures. And a lot of the stuff. I mean, Tumblr is kind of the wild, wild west right now, man. There's there's some rough stuff on Tumblr. Anyhow, Snapchat 200 million, Skype 300 million, Reddit 220, Instagram 400 million, Twitter 320, Vine 200, LinkedIn 100, Pinterest 100. Okay, people are online. People are networking online. People are communicating. People are getting information. They're giving information. They're teaching. They're learning. And it's all happening in these networks. Okay, my wife now, if she wants to make lemon bars, she goes right to Pinterest. Where someone, somebody has pinned something that somebody else created that teaches her how to make lemon bars. If my daughter wants to make snickerdoodles, or if she wants to make a frittata, or whatever it is she wants, to, or she wants to make um, custom Mickey Mickey ears to go to Disneyland with, she goes to Pinterest and finds, you know, someone to teach her how to do that. It's something she wants to learn, and she finds her own teacher. She doesn't come up and say, "Dad, how do you make flowery Mickey ears?" I'm like, hmm, I don't know, you know. She doesn't come to me. She goes, she goes to Pinterest. She's found her teachers. She's found the site where she, where she interacts and her net, it's her, that's her network. And it's, you know, that's, that, that's the way it is. Okay. So as teachers, man, what do we do and how do we deal with this and how do we leverage this to make us different? The, uh, one of the answers is a personal learning network. Or a PLN, okay, and that's gonna. This is gonna be the the the, the chunk, the huge chunk of what we're gonna is well, what we're gonna cover tonight. This personal learning network, and so this is this is a term that you know if you're if you're in edu education for any certain time and you are getting connected, right? This is something that is is of huge value. Is understanding what 
a personal learning network is and how you actually cultivate it and grow it. Okay, for me as a teacher, this honestly was the single most valuable thing in my entire teaching career. Was was understanding what a personal learning network is and then what it, what it means to me and how how I interact with it with that and what what I make of it. Okay? And so this is this is a topic that is insanely personal to me because um I don't it's very challenging for me to separate my the professional me and the personal me. Okay? That they're the same. When I go home and I'm hanging out and um, my whole family's watching Gilmore Girls on Netflix, I'm on my computer going through Twitter and I'm reading different things from my from my blog feeder and I'm just you know and I'm and I'm interacting with my personal learning network during my personal time. You know what I mean? And so it's just I mean a teacher is, is what and who I am, not just my job. And so it's something I mean honestly, and this is this has become. Um, just the just the hugest thing, and and you'll you'll hear, you'll hear a lot of teachers saying that. Um, a real short video here, just to kind of break down uh, PLN, and then I'll I'll give you a little deeper definition in a sec. There's no way I am going to be the best at everything, but if I surround myself with people that do are doing great things, then I am going to benefit from their knowledge as well as the people that they've learned from. It creates this peer-to-peer -peer network. That's not necessarily all face-to-face -face every time at the conference, but really connects you to people online through through these resources and, and, and through their learning networks, through their smaller affiliates. You know, being a, having a regional group you can connect with uh, is a great, great asset to educators. The power of the network is proportional to the square of the nodes. Um, and the more, what that means is as you double a group of people working on something, you've, you've quadrupled the, the creative power, the effective power of, of that group. That ability to connect more frequently really, I think, has strengthened um, the Q membership and, and the value that I find in Q because now it's not just once or twice a year or at a local conference, but all of a sudden it's every day. You know you're not alone. And that. Just real quick, they keep mentioning this thing, Q. Uh, Q is a, a use of, it's computer using educators. It's it's basically a uh, a, a nonprofit. I, they might even be for profit now. They used to they used to be nonprofit, but it's um basically it's an organization that that is committed to training teachers and technology and connecting teachers and technology. Uh, this isn't a an advertisement for Q as much as it is just kind of an introduction to PLNs. It's really what Q is. It's that personal learning network. It's that community of practice. It is that group of people that you can go to or inquire to. I'm thinking about doing this. How do you think it's going to work? There is just this very vibrant and um, very uh, active and passionate community of educators out there. Which leads to more people you know and more people you know. It just keeps that learning growing. You can't possibly know it all yourself. You need to look to people who are great at different areas and, and keep building those over time to keep you know your own learning moving as an educator. I've been able to expand on what I've been doing beyond just the classroom and with my with my colleagues or within my district even to you know the entire world. And we're able to reach a much bigger audience and help individual educators build that personal learning network, uh, leveraging the resources of the organization and the history of the organization and the uh, innovative approaches of our members and, and leaders. So it's been truly powerful for us to be able to leverage those tools and expand. Now I have all these brains that I can access you know, anywhere in the world. So for me, a personal learning network is so critical because I know I don't have all the answers. And so, but there's someone in my network who probably does. So for me, that's, that's really powerful. And that community is being uh, enhanced every day. I think the most um, of all the things that were said in that video, and it's okay, sorry about that. The most powerful thing that was said um, was by her. Much bigger audience and how powerful for us to be able to leverage those tools and expand. Now I have all these brains that I can access. All the brain, all these brains I can access. Okay, here I am with my one little brain, and I can think of 
so many things. Let's say, say, let's say that the representation of what I can think of with my little brain is 10 things. Okay. And each of us with our little brains can think of 10, have, have 10 ideas, 10 great ideas. And so in this room, we have eight, so 80 great ideas. Okay. Um, and so if you think, think of us as a teaching staff, so we, we, we make up the teaching staff of XYZ school and we're pretty much each other's PLN, our personal learning network. Okay. We are, we, before, before the internet, before any, any of the tools that I'm going to talk about tonight, the only teachers that I ever make any contact with are the ones that I work with every day. Okay, and I only have access to their ideas and mine. I may read a book every once in a while, so I'll have access to this author and that author's great idea. I may go to a conference or two during the year, and so I have access to some of the ideas that, that I run into at that conference. And keep in mind that my great idea, my, my, my 10 great ideas, you might think are crap. You know what I mean? My great idea might be that, you know, I'm going to photocopy this worksheet on two, on double-sided rather than just, you know, on one side. That might be my great idea. You know, I, so, so my great idea might not be anything special to you, right? So, you know, not, not saying, you know, because 80 great ideas sounds pretty cool. But, um, you know, think, think about the fact that, you know, what, what if there are 80 great ideas, but you, but you only like your 10, or, you know, or maybe only like five of your 10, or whatever it is. So you're, you're fair, you were fairly limited, okay, to just the people who are in front of you physically. And, and that's, that's, you know, so, so when I started teaching, it was all about, you know, I'm just, I'm building these, these, less, you know, all about lesson planning, building lesson planning, building lesson plans, building lesson plans. And, you know, so when, when I started working, I was, a, a, I had an internet at home and in my classroom, but it was the, you know, the, the bing bong boing uh, modem that I had to connect to my phone. And I couldn't, a dial up modem where I couldn't use my phone and my computer at the same time because they used the same line. And, you know, if the websites were fairly limited, but, but teachers were already starting to put their websites online. It was where did I? Oh man, I think I I think I threw it away. But um, I want to say, and it's pretty weird. That let's see. Did I trash it or did I keep it? I I just just today. I don't know if it was on my Gmail account. I think it was. Maybe not. No, it might have been on my actual email. I I got a, a note from somebody who found a lesson plan that I wrote and was saying, hey, this is a dead link in your in your in this lesson plan you wrote. No, oh, right here. So English Online California, and it was a, <laughs> so they said, I wanted to let you know that unfortunately the blank link is broken. I assume you may want to take it down when you have a spare minute. So this site was one that uh, I, got, I got contracted years ago, like in the early 2000s by this company, this company in New Zealand that or it might have even been a dis I think it was a district no it was the district of the ministry of education in New Zealand so the entire country of New Zealand their ministry of education they had all these lesson plans and they had them online but they wanted to market themselves to California so they contracted me and a couple other friends of mine to take lesson plans that they already had in New Zealand and retool them for use in California because well, they would use like colloquial words from New Zealand that wouldn't make sense in California like favorite had an OU instead of an O so I did all that editing and then they actually paid me to design my own lesson plans and put them in there it was pretty cool it was actually really paid me a lot of money to do relatively little it was very cool those things don't come around anymore but 
Um, actually, they they contact. I was so I was I had some connections with uh, the National Council of Teachers of English, and so I got kind of got it through that. And so this is randomly. I mean, I haven't even thought about this in years. And you know, this is this is a lesson plan I wrote on Bell Jar in like the early two thousands on Sylvia Plath's novel, The Bell Jar. And so it's like this, you know, and so it's it's the way that things just kind of hang out on the internet, but you would find things like this on the internet way back then that looked like this. I mean, this is very plain looking. It does have a lot of links and I'm not sure how many of these things actually work. Apparently, there we go. Uh, stuff from, I don't know, that, that doesn't look like that's, oh, that just goes right to the New York Times blog. But there's, you know, there's just different, wow, the Sylvia Plath Forum. Yikes. Okay. In any case, um, so that's this is what these lesson plans would look like. But you'd be able to find lesson plans here and there, right? But you weren't really connecting with anybody back then. And so, you know, it, it was just kind of this real interesting environment where I compare, by Keith, to what we have now in the idea, you know, in the realm of the, the PLN, and it's just vastly different. It's vastly different. And so just kind of getting into what that looks like and what that means for us. Um, the PLN breakdown, I like to break it down backwards. Personal learning network, I'm just going to go with network first. Group of people that you associate with. Okay. In this case, when we're in our, in our definition of this network, it can be people that you see face to face, people that you know personally, or people that you never see face to face and don't know at all. And they don't know you. Okay. So a network, again, any group of people with whom you have either a two-way relationship or one-way relationship. And I'll, we'll kind of break that down a little more first. Learning anytime, any place. Okay? Not confined to a classroom. Okay? And the idea of learning collaboratively becomes just huge during this, during this time that we're in. Because we can communicate with people from all over the place. Okay. One, one person who I collaborate with all the time right now is a librarian. Actually, he calls himself a labrarian because he's turned his library into a, a maker lab, right? But his, his name is David Saunders. He lives in Connecticut. We collaborate on stuff all the time. We couldn't be, we almost couldn't be further from each other in the continental United States, but we are always talking. We're always collaborating. I, you know, I've, I've only, uh, seen David face to face twice in the last five years, and we've we we connect and collaborate all the time. Okay, so and and it's so it it doesn't have to be right here right now. It can be a lot of different ways, but the the idea of collaboration is huge. Okay, and then personal um, PLN can also stand for professional learning network. And I know that, um, you know, like in, in my district, we have something called, we call them PLCs, they're professional learning communities, right? For me, I, I, I like I've mentioned earlier, I, I make no distinction between personal and professional when it comes to being a teacher. I mean, it's just what I am. And that's, so I, I prefer the term personal because it makes it more personal. It means that at any time I am, I'm investing in my own professional development. One of the things you'll find, whether you and and one of the things that if you're already in the classroom and already around teachers, and uh, but if you're not, and you will be someday. One of the things you'll find out is teachers are always bitching and moaning about professional development. They don't give us enough PD. Where's all the PD? That wasn't good PD. I didn't like that PD. You know, it's like you you have to be responsible to develop yourself as a professional. Doctors do it. Lawyers do it. Professionals develop themselves. They don't sit around and wait for someone to develop them. Okay, and it's one of the bad raps that teachers get in professional communities is that we're kind of babies. Waiting for somebody to do for us what we should be doing for ourselves. So this is full soapbox material here. So this isn't out of a textbook. This is my, my personal viewpoint. So, um, Do you know a lot about like, a lot of different districts and PLCs? Like, I know I've only worked with Mm -hmm. So their PLC is just strictly grade level. Mm -hmm. They each do their own grade level PLC. Right. Do, is there a lot of districts that do like a whole school? No, usually PLCs are smaller. Yeah, so they're like grade level at, at the middle school and high school levels. They're usually subject. Right. 
you know, subject PLC. So your PLC is now your, like your English department can be a PLC. And then you can have like breakout PLCs where it's just your, you know, 11th and 12th grade teachers right. because right. those, those, uh, common core centers are the same in your ninth and 10th. So, you know, it just kind of depends on, on what, um, either the district or even the school, uh, decides they want as far as, you know, what they want to call a PLC. Um, but in red here, or brick, this is my favorite color, sorry, you're going to see it a lot. Uh, a personal learning network is the network of people with whom you connect, both in person and online, to learn from and to share information with, to facilitate learning and personal and professional growth for whatever passion you follow. In terms of a PLN, your value to others is often what you share, both original ideas and content, as well as passing on what you have learned from others. Okay, it's about sharing, okay, and not hoarding knowledge, okay, because someday you're going to be dead in your house, and they're going to find all kinds of knowledge along with the, uh, with the 300 cats that, that, you know, okay, we don't hoard knowledge. As teachers, we share knowledge, right? Okay, so cultivating your PLN. I'm going to give you base, the basic three steps behind cultivating your PLN as far as, as far as I'm concerned. And the first one is reading. There's no, getting, there's no getting around that. There's a lot of things out there to read. Okay? A lot of things out there to read. It's, it's funny that, that we're swinging back around to books. And a lot of educators are now writing books. They're self-publishing. Or they're, they're, you know, they're, they're developing. The way to publish books now is so, you know, it's, it's much easier. So there's a lot of books out there. I'm not really sharing any of those right now. I may uh, put together a list of books if you're interested. But what I have here is blogs. The, thing, the reason I like blogs over books, especially when it comes to, you know, my passion is educational technology as far as, you know, this the kind of overarching um, uh, category. But, you know, as far as ed tech is concerned, you publish a book and, you know, by the time it actually hits the shelves or is available on Amazon, half the stuff has already changed, right? Like there's a, there's, there's a book, this is my favorite example, is, uh, so, these couple of women wrote this book called 50 things you can do with Google Classroom. How many of you have heard or used, heard of or used Google Classroom? Okay, awesome. So 50 things you can do with Google Classroom. And it came out uh, May 1st, 2015. And, uh, you know, so this, this chick, Alice Keeler, she's on Twitter. And I see her a lot. I, I don't follow her anymore because she's a little crazy, but, um, just the little crazy is she had like this hardcore Twitter war with a bunch of people because she threw out the, the idea that that cursive isn't valuable anymore. Like, why do we teach it? And then she had all these people that were like cursivites who were like going after her. It's an art form. It's well, and then this is fuel after that war. And I was just dominating my Twitter feed for like 72 hours. I was like, I can't follow you anymore. You make me crazy. Oh yeah. yeah. So she wrote this, she wrote, she with, with another person wrote this book, 50 things you can do with Google Classroom for like, for like a month, for like a month before it came out. She was like pimping herself on Twitter. Like, get this book, get this book. It's coming out. It's coming out. It's coming out. 50 things you can do on, on Google Classroom. Uh, it comes out on May 1st, May 1st, May 1st on like April 27th, Google Classroom didn't change the, it didn't change what it was already doing, but it added all kinds of features on like three days before this book came out. So here's, here we have a book that's published and after a huge, like three days after a huge update. And so the 50 things that she has in there, you can do 50 more things that they don't even, that aren't even recognized in the book. And so it's tough to write a book, especially about technology, when technology changes so quickly. Okay, but the great thing about blogs is that they are immediate. When all those changes were made in Google Classroom on that date, there were umpteen blogs that, boom, that, that were there with it. Okay, and so um, for me, if I want to, one of the ways that I interact, okay, and cultivate my PLN 
is by reading. And I've got I've got a lot of different educators whose blogs I follow. Okay, one of the, the most challenging thing about reading blogs is actually going to all those different websites. And so on Tuesday we talked about RSS. Okay, and I told you that that little symbol there stood for RSS, right? And so, and because because I was someone asked, right? What is what does RSS mean? That's right. That's how that popped up. And so RSS, and I told you on Tuesday, it stands for really simple syndication. And basically, it's like subscribing to a newspaper, or subscribing to a magazine, although except you're doing it online. Okay, and you subscribe to uh blogs through really simple syndication by using what's called an RSS aggregator or a news reader or an RSS reader and the best one that I found is called Feedly F-E-E-D-L-Y and so what I have here is a I have a group of of different um, blogs that I follow and that are varying degrees of awesome Okay, this is a my, this is my estimation. They feed they feed what I look for in education. If you're a kindergarten teacher, uh, you there will be other blogs that you follow. You know what I mean? It's you have to kind of but there are so many out there. So many blogs out there written by teachers active in the classroom. Um, educators who used to be teachers in the classroom are now working in a different capacity, either as a, an instructional coach or a principal, or you know they're you know working for like Edutopia. So here's one called Edutopia. Edutopia is um, the uh, George Lucas Foundation educational website, and they basically have blogs written by all kinds of different people from different realms. So if I look down their their recent blog post here, here's you know summer reading six sci-fi books to create classroom discussion about freedom, climate change and, and game-based learning, five ways to use scannable tech in the math classroom, navigating your identity as a parent and an educator. You know there's so you know each one I don't think any one of those blog uh, posts that I just mentioned had anything to do with the one that I mentioned before it. So Edutopia is great because they deal with all kinds of different issues in education. Teaching young children about bias, diversity, and social justice. Five questions that promote student success in high poverty schools. I mean, and none of these blog articles are like page, they're not like New York Times articles, right? They're fairly quick and easy to read. And if I go to each one of these sites, okay, I can I can just look at Ditch That Textbook, another one of my my current favorites. Um, and ditch that textbook is a guy by a, a teacher by the name of Matt Miller, who you know, who basically has just a lot of cool tidbits. You know, oh look at this: thirteen ways to create unforgettable multimedia with Adobe Spark. This is June second. We just used that, so we know all about that. How school can look more like an episode of Phineas and Ferb. Okay, this is you know this. So this is a this is a blog that's written by one guy. Okay, used to be a teacher and now is basically like a, a public speaker. He goes, you know, just does workshops with schools, conferences, all that stuff. Has his own book or a couple of books now, I think. So I could go to each one of these websites and look at all the different titles. Or I can use my RSS aggregator, Feedly, and I can get them all in one place. So let's let's kind of check out how this this RSS it is, an app. it is a website, it is an app, it is all of the above. Okay. So I am <coughs> so I can do one of two things. I can go to feedly.com and by when I say I can it means you can too. I can go to feedly.com or I could open up the Feedly app on my iPad, and I can um, and I can use it there. I usually use Feedly on my iPad because I can just kind of chill out and and go through my material on my on my Mini here. That's that's kind of my way of doing it. So I kind of use 
I kind of use this as my magazine because there's no, it basically allows you to create a magazine that is tailored specifically to you. Okay, Feedly used to be completely free and it bummed me out that they recently um, did a, they recently created their a freemium model. Have you heard that term before, freemium? Where they give you a little taster for free and then they charge you for upgrades. So you can, you can have a hundred RSS feeds in Feedly for free. So that means I can I can I can uh, subscribe to a hundred different blogs through Feedly for free. I think that's probably good enough for me. Um, but this is so this is my iPad, and so I have different categories. I have a culture category. I have an ed tech category. I have an education category. I have Google. I have Maker Ed, and I have uncategorized, which is I don't. That's not mine. That's already there. So let's say that I just wanted to take a look at the blog posts in my Google feed. And if I hit my little down, oh, you went away, that's too bad. Okay, I hit the little down arrow ahead next to Google, and I can see I have the official Google blog, the YouTube blog, Gmail, Google Chrome, Google Docs, and Google open source blogs in my Google um, category. And if I click on that, it's only going to show me the blog posts that are in that category. So if I'm looking specifically for that, right, that's that's a good deal. Um, I'm going to get a little more robust here and I want to look at my ed tech category. So if I if I click on that, that's going to give me now all of the um, posts from all of the different blogs I have in my ed tech category. So it becomes now kind of like a magazine where I can see here's one, new beginnings, new opportunities, how online middle school classes prepare your student for higher learning, Not nothing interesting me yet. Khan Academy announces a talent search. Let me see, what's that all about? I click on that, it gives me a little shot of it. Okay, so this is super this is a super short post from Free Technology for Teachers. I read that, I move on. 16, wait, let me go back. 16 great iPad apps for students with special needs. So this is an infographic from Educational Technology and Mobile Learning. And I can kind of look here at their infographic. And if I want to read more, I can visit their website and actually take a look at the entire article, which again is not that long. It has a little preface and, and that's it. So I can decide what I want to look at from a whole slew of RSS feeds that I subscribe to in Feedly. Bloom's Taxonomy according to Monsters Incorporated. There we go. It's a YouTube video, Bloom's Taxonomy Monsters Incorporated. That one's pretty cool. And so if I find one that I really like and I want to save for later, I want to share with somebody, there's a lot of different things I can do up here at the top. My wife asked me if I got there on time, and I did. Okay, I can bookmark it in Feedly. I can tweet it out to people. I can hit my little Twitter bird here, and I can tweet out to my, you know, the people that follow me on Twitter. I can add a couple of hashtags on there. <laughs> And I can post it so that I can share it now with people who follow me on Twitter, which is kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but that's that's a that's a sweet thing. I mean that that now I am sharing a resource that I think is valuable. Okay, so really the way that I use blogging, it's really this is really a one-way deal here, where somebody is writing something. And I am benefiting from that. I know very few of the people who write the blogs that I subscribe to. I want to say four people that I know personally that I can send an email to or send a message to and they know who I am and I know who they are. The rest of the many, many blogs that I follow, I don't know who they, they don't know who I am. No idea. Or if they do, We've never contacted each other. But they are a part of my personal learning network because I learn from them.
Okay, so when I when I looked at my RSS feeder here, you can see right here in EdTech, there are 561 posts since the last time that I opened this up and looked at it. So of the 80 ideas we had in that in this room together, if we're all in each other's PLN and there are 80 ideas in here, here's 561 more that I haven't that I haven't checked out yet and I can. You know what I mean? So I've just increased my my uh, good I my my pool of ideas sevenfold just by opening my RSS reader and click clicking on ed tech and looking through these articles on my iPad okay so reading is a, I mean re reading is a huge deal and you can see that it, it's it's not like again you're not reading you know a 400 page book you're reading a super short blog article that may that may help you out special edition of classroom instruction resources of the week so here's some different classroom resources that someone's pulled together that one's kind of interesting five reasons to have the classroom blog uh, let's see five ways to quickly get your students on the same web page so these are just very quick five really short reasons really really short ways so let's say that you know I'm using websites in my classroom and it's a huge pain in my neck to try and get them all to go to the same web page at the same time go to Google and type this in and then go here and or you know whatever it is right the first one's a QR code so you guys know what a QR code is right the little block that you can scan with your phone and it takes you to a web page right so if you put if you put up a QR code in your in your classroom then you have the kids scan the QR code real quick boom it takes them right to that web page there's a great idea I just learned I didn't have that before and now I use it every day in my classroom because I know I want kids to get to their to, to the, a web page super quickly and I don't want them fussing around going to Google doing this getting distracted here boop they're on the web page QR codes awesome I'm gonna use them all the time now I just learned from someone on my PLN. I don't even know their name. Don't know who they are. Who is this? Oh, okay, free technology for teachers. Richard Byrne. Richard Byrne's a smart guy. Okay. So it, you know, it's it. This is the power that that is it, that is there. I mean, as and again, as a teacher, I didn't have to go to a uh, you know a full day professional development that my school put on to learn about. Uh, how to use a QR code in my classroom. I read it in a couple minutes and then I said, hmm, QR codes, I've never used those before. How do I use them? Google, using QR codes in the classroom. Boom, you need this app, that app, that, that other app. You take a, make a photocopy of the QR code that you create that's attached to this website. You print it out, you stick it on your wall in three places in your classroom and you have students take your classroom iPads or whatever the technology they have. They use the camera, boop, they take a picture of it, takes them right to the, you know what I mean? It's like, that's, that's pretty easy. I don't need to go to a training to know how to do that. I can figure that out on my own. I'm a smart person. I'm a teacher. I'm an educator. I have a master's degree. I can figure that out. Okay. I don't need someone with a doctorate to stand in front of me and tell me that. I can just look it up and figure it out. Okay. And so reading, it's a huge deal. Okay. And so Feedly's a good one. There are other RSS um, feeders out there, and um, it's it's the one it's the one thing it's one of the few things that you can do to instantly up your game as a teacher. And it just this, this goes beyond ed tech. There are tons of of people in special ed who are blogging, severe to moderate that are blogging language teachers that are blogging, math teachers that are blogging, so on and so forth. It's not just it's not just an ed tech thing. It's tons of administrators, principals who are blogging. I mean, it's just there it's 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 big time. It's out there and people are doing it and they're just doing it. It's not like they're getting the very few people that are getting paid to blog. This is a community that's just sharing. Right? Sharing thoughts, sharing ideas, sharing resources. 
All right, so our community discussion for this session, for this week, is, um, is kind of like the first one in, in that you're sharing a blog. It's different in the fact that this is, I want this blog to be centered on education. If you already follow any kind of education blog, you are more than welcome to share it. Okay, but if you don't, then I want you to search for a blog that interests you. It can be one of the ones that I shared. It doesn't, it by no means has to be. Those are blogs that interest me. And if they interest you too, that's awesome. But find a, find a blog that interests you and share it with the community. Okay, I'm going to do it right now so that I know it happens. I'm going to edit this com our community to have a new category, which is CD2. Edu blog share. I'm also going to add our project for today. Yep. So I just changed that. So here it is. CD2 Edu blog share. Okay, so that's as part of your awesome Carnegie hours. You can dive in, find a blog that you are that that an education blog that knocks your socks off, and share it with the rest of us. Okay, any questions or comments about reading? Okay, we're kind of at, at, a, at a moment of, of decision, okay, where I think I have an hour or less left in me. So do you want to break to eat or do you want to plow through and leave a half an hour earlier than we would if we didn't, no, if we broke, yes. Everyone good with that? Okay, no one needs nourishment or to go on or, or to misplace their phone at some a random place. We're good. You know what's funny is is we had a ex, an extremely painful and awful PD session today from 1 to 3 and I left like 20 minutes early. I snuck out. I left my phone there. Oh. So I had to sneak back in and go like, give me my phone, and then s not really sneak back out, but whatever. Okay, so so one of the three, you know, kind of my 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 triumvirate here of, of how to cultivate your PLN really well is to read. Okay? That's that that is the most unintrusive thing you can do is read. No one knows that you're subscribing to their RSS feed. You, you, you can be totally undercover about it and just chill at home and you know in your RSS feeder and you can look at all the different things to read in your feed. So feed your need to read your feed. Okay? And so you, you know you can have it look a couple different ways on, on the web, but this, you know, so if I just take my ed tech, it can look kind of like this. Um, you can, so if you click on the little gear up here, if you're using the web version, you can have it, you can get title only, which looks like that, kind of like email. You can make it look like a magazine, which is that, that's magazine view. You can do cards view. which looks like that. You can do full articles, which kind of give you, yeah, the entire thing. So it's, you know, there's a lot of different ways that you can, that, that you can mess with the, the interface of, How do you, get, like, do you, have your ed tech, your education, Google? you create, you create categories what? over here. Okay. So good. That? that is a great question. And one that I forgot to answer. Sorry, I'm just no, no, it's a, Again, a great question, one that I forgot to answer. So let's say 
that I want to look for a blog. I'm so glad that you jogged me there because. So I want to look for a blog and I want to look for a blog about special education. So, oh, this is kind of cool. And the, what you'll find on a lot of different, um, a lot of different, there are websites that kind of gather them for you, which is really cool. So here's 50 must-see blogs for special education teachers. I can see here that this article is from 2012. So that's, you know, four years ago. But if I click, but blogs are, you know, people are constantly writing in blogs. So if I go here and here's one called Reality 101 and let me, let me look at that one. See what it looks like? No. I'm not digging one that looks like this. That is not my jam. Oh, wait. No, okay. Yeah, not my jam. So let's see. Um, teacher Soul. How about that? Looks So what the cool thing about a blog is I can jump in and see when was the last time this person wrote something? Because blogs, blogs feed chronologically. So last time she wrote something was November 24th, 2015. Does that mean that there's nothing good in here? No. It just means that she hasn't written in her blog since, you know, last year. But if I look through here and I glance through here, I can see personally there's not enough on here about education that really knocks my socks off. So goodbye. Life in special education. Let's see this. One room schoolhouse. Here's a. I see some cool resources here. Uh, the la the last post was June fourteenth, two thousand sixteen, which was last week, and it's a dinosaur STEM unit research with QR codes. That looks kind of cool. They're building stuff. She's got a lot of pictures. Um, this is. Let's see what the next one is. No prep interactive smart phonics. Yeah, lots. There's pictures. It looks like it's about some kind of an app. Uh, the winners are someone won an Olive Garden gift card. I'm not really down with that. The Hoop Glider. How far will it go? Hoop Glider STEM Challenge. So this looks like a blog that I'd be interested in as a as a special ed teacher of of you know primary age primary school kids. So what I'm going to do to to actually subscribe to this blog is I'm going to grab that URL. A lot of grabbing of URLs in, in tech these days, and I'm going to copy that URL. I'm going to go back to my RSS feeder, and up here under search, I'm just going to type in, I'm just going to paste in that URL. And you can see that right here, that source pops up, and I'm going to click on it. And it's going to give me a glimpse as to what that blog looks like. And so this is kind of like a, a nice little nutshell version of, of that blog site. And so Summer Countdown, Tower of Terror, STEM Challenge, Catapults. Yeah, yeah, I, I absolutely want to subscribe to this to this uh, blog. And so right up here at the top, you'll see a plus button. You click that to add it, and then you can choose which category to put it in. I don't have categories. You don't because you haven't made them yet. Do you, you should have new collection or something like that right there. You click on that, and it allows you to create a category. Okay, so I would create a new category called SPED, and I would create that, and now I have that category. And that blog is now part of my feed. So to edit one in this, can you edit it once you add like... Can you like take, take some out? Oh, can you move them around in categories? Yeah. Uh, I'm sure there is. Do I know what that way is? No, I don't. Yeah, that would be a... No, filters. Oh, well, there's a way to remove it. Um, edit subscription. So clicking on the gear, when you when you click directly on the blog over here on the on the right hand side on the left hand side if you click on that gear not only does it allow you to figure out the presentation but I can come right here to edit subscription 
and then I can move it to, and you can you can have it in more than one right. as well. Right. So it can be part of more, it can be in more than one of your collections. Yes. Any other questions before we get to tweeting? How many of you are have ever tweeted something? Oh man, this is gonna be easy. Are you like is it just one thing or do you use Twitter? In college I did. I use Twitter too. Okay. Okay. <laughs> for education or for personal? Personal. Okay. So we're gonna talk about using Twitter for teaching okay my Twitter feed is probably 90% professional and 10% personal if I had to if I was using those breakdowns right 90% education stuff and 10% you know sports stuff and other things that I'm interested in stuff okay but the majority of things on my Twitter feed are education based okay I pretty much use Facebook as my as my personal thing and every other and and bless you and Instagram is kind of my Instagram is kind of my part professional part personal that's probably my most hybrid um, uh, network that I, that I use um, but Twitter is my just a whole lot of um, professional stuff that I in, in Twitter and I Pinterest is the same way. Pinterest for me is like ninety percent professional, and we'll talk about Pinterest after we're after we talk about Twitter. So, Twitter is the one tool that has the power <clears throat> to connect you with other teachers and their ideas more than all of the anything else put together. Everything else, put it all in one big sack, and it doesn't even come close to having the power that Twitter has to really change your teaching practice. And I say that I say that not it's not hyperbole. Uh, I really feel that. Okay? That I mean Twitter's like this insanely just magical thing that has the power to really change the way that you teach and to really connect you with other teachers. And it's like crazy to I know it's like I've never even thought about it in those terms. But um, I've got a couple of videos here, one that I'm going to show and one that I'm just going to leave here um, because the one that I'm leaving here is for you to explore on your own if you want to, if, if you hearing from me is not enough. But I, I just like the, the way that this little video is put together and it's only a couple minutes long, so we're going to watch it. <clears throat> Hello, Derek here. We're going to talk about uh, Twitter and how you can use it for professional development. So why? Why Twitter? And how can I use it to enhance my professional development? So as a teacher, sometimes it really feels like you're the sage on the stage. You feel like you're the only person, it's you and the students, and maybe a few educators in your building. But the reality is there are educators all over the world, and not just educators, but other people that have valuable information that they can give to you. And we've always known that, but making that connection has always been a bit challenging. How do we connect all of those people with you, that one person in a classroom? So those people, who are they? Well, they're your PLN, your personal learning network. And now, more than ever before, your personal learning network can expand to much, much bigger places than it had ever been. Not just the teacher down the hallway, your administrator and colleagues that you know, but we can go to other educational specialists that perhaps you never really had access to before. And in my PLN, I find one of the most valuable groups are non-educators, psychologists, university professors, all sorts of people that might have uh, an expertise that outside of my PLN I have a hard time actually connecting to. So the way we deliver this PLN is through Twitter. And who are we talking to? Well, you're gonna build your own network of people and here's some of mine, um, as your conversations go organically. What are you going to talk about? Well, hashtags and Twitter chats are a great opportunity to figure out what is going on. The beautiful part is when. It is around the clock. 
Every micro moment you have, if you want, you can be doing this. And why, of course, we want to support students. So this Twitter is such a great opportunity for us to develop professionally. Hopefully you take a moment, sign up, and check out a few of these chats. All the best. All right. So I'd never seen this video scribe tool before. It looks pretty fun. Um, kind of, It kind of helps you. It's kind of a digital way of creating the kind of animation, animated video that you guys that I gave you, like the, the Ken Robinson one that's animated on the white the whiteboard animation. Yeah. Um, it's an app. It looks like it. Yeah, I haven't used I've it before. For one forever and I can't find one. So I don't know if it's a pay thing. I just again, I just found this because you know, it's video scribe, make your own whiteboard videos. There it is. Free trial. There's pricing, so it obviously costs some money, but it's interesting. Might be interesting to play with. So, in it, that's that's it in a, in a nutshell. Is that there are so there's thousands of teachers that are on Twitter and are using Twitter to share all kinds of things. To share all kinds of things. So if you are not on Twitter, part of your job this week is to get on Twitter. You're going to start an account, even if. You don't have any social media accounts. You're now going to have one. You're going to have Twitter. Okay, um, Twitter's Twitter's cool in that um, you don't have to be friends with anybody. Nobody has to accept you. You do follow people, okay? But they don't have to accept you. You can follow whoever you please, whoever you want, okay? The cool thing about the, the teaching community on Twitter is that, yeah, they're, they're like, what's the point of being private if you're. And if you're, if you're not private, you can, you just, there's some way you can just follow me down. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to go to Twitter real quick. I'm right there with you. Facebook. Do you have Facebook? I don't use them. I'm going to jump into Twitter real quick, and um, I am going to just do a Twitter search. Okay, I want to find something that I'm interested in. So let's say I type in, if I can spell, I'm having trouble doing just a education technology. Okay, so I just do a search for education technology. And I, you know, so when I do a search in Twitter, I get a couple of um, accounts that come up here on the top, but then I also get, you know, any tweet that somebody sends out that has the words education technology in it. And so as I look through here, um, I'm finding people. In this case, I'm finding uh, the Future of Museums, the Center for the Future of Museums. I'm finding... Uh, Let's see, Promethean, which is a company. Here's Kelly Hollis, who appears to be, if I hover over her name, I can see here that she is a high school science bio pirate, TL, hashtag TLAP, which I know because I you know, participate in the Twitter sphere as far as education is concerned. It stands for Teach Like a Pirate, which is a, a book and a movement by a guy named uh, Dave, oh gosh, what's Dave? Can I ask you a question really quick, though, since I'm not familiar with it? I, I always see, you know, people tweeting and they've got these hashtags yes. and all these things. Every one of those things, they have a hashtag to take you to, I don't know, whether that's page or... Yes, so we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna cover all that right now, okay? So she's a T-Lap, a Teach Like a Pirate teacher, a uh, hashtag Aussie Ed, so I know now that she's from Australia, most likely. Uh, Co-moderator, we'll talk about that. Overpassionate West's Tigers fan, aspiring photographer. Okay, so she is a teacher, and I might want to just check out Kelly Hollis real quick. I'm going to click on her name. It's going to take me to her Twitter page, and I'm going to look down her Twitter feed. I see pictures. Uh, she's got uh, a lot of interesting things here. I don't know. A lot of it's very personal. Here's some. All right, we're back in business. So this looks like somebody that I think that I would benefit from 
She's sharing a lot of articles that really connect with me. Seven questions every new teacher should be able to answer. Um, teaching, not preaching. Crow language. Instructors learn tech. Blah, blah. Yeah, okay, so this might be somebody that I want to follow. And so in everybody's on everybody's Twitter page, there is a follow button. And I click follow, and I am now, this Lisa Reagan is now part of my PLN. This is somebody that I can learn from. And the cool thing is, is that she gets a little message in her notifications here that somebody is, that I just followed her. She can then click this. I do this all the time when someone follows me. Someone named Henry Rose Lee followed me, founder and CEO, turning millennials into great leaders in tech, fine, fintech. And I see I'm not interested in you. You're not a teacher. I don't want to follow you back. Uh, let's see. Justin Bell, English combines my many passions, psychology. So this might be a guy that I want to follow back. I'm going to take a look at his tweets real quick. Yes, somebody I want to follow. So I'm going to follow him back. So it becomes this kind of community now where someone finds me somehow, follows me. I see that they follow me. I take a look at what they've got going on, and I follow them back. And now we are part of each other's PLNs. We are part of each other's learning networks. He may learn something from me. I may learn something from him. We will never meet. We will never talk, most likely. Okay? But now we have some sort of influence or have the ability to influence each other's teaching practice just by the stuff we tweet. So if I go to my profile page and something that I tweeted like just 30 minutes ago, a video on Bloom's Taxonomy according to Monsters Inc., I tweeted that out. He may be doing a training in his school on Bloom's Taxonomy and he uses the video that I tweeted as part of his presentation. Okay, I tweeted June 3rd a, uh, a global forest change explorer from Google. It basically shows you uh, a, um, it's a tool that allows you to explore deforestation from a map, from a mapping point of view. It's something that I tweeted because I found it interesting. It's something that I most likely will never use in my classroom. But it's something that I personally found interesting and know that other people would find interesting, especially if it's something that they, that they want to connect kids to. And if I have a kid that has a, a passion for, uh, for, you know, something like this, it's a, it's somewhere that I can point them to. Right? But it's something that I tweeted that hope, that maybe, hopefully, somebody who's following me on Twitter connects with and is able to utilize it in some way, shape, or form. And in that way, something that I found, a resource that I found, I am now sharing with them. Okay, and you can see from my tweets, there's two things that I tweet. Most, a lot of my Instagram photos, so I go into Instagram and I share it with Facebook and, um, and Twitter. Allows me to automatically do that. So the other day when I got together, with a bunch of uh, people who are doing project-based learning in my district. I shared the Instagram photo from that and I used my 3D camera to create it and it's I created a tiny planet picture out of it so there our whole little group there standing together using the 360 camera and then a cool little tiny planet edit on it and I shared that on on Twitter. So I share my Instagram photos not all of them but some of them and um, and then I and then educational resources. The, set, the five habits that made Elon Musk an innovator, um, open IDO, the survey that half the teachers would not quit for a higher, higher paying job stunned me. So I'm just sending things out into the, into the universe, right? And so we have this question now. What is, what's up with the hashtags? And how, how do we use hashtags? Besides just kind of like fun, right? Hashtags are, some, are, are a lot of times now used to, as, kind of a, as kind of jokey stuff, right? So you might, you know, put a hashtag like, oh, my aching back or something like that. You know, like here I am carrying a box up the stairs, hashtag, oh, my aching back, and boy, are my feet tired or whatever it is, right? But hashtags are, are really used for categorization and for, 
outreach, right? So I know that, so one of the, one of the hashtags that I use in, in some of my tweets is this one, TTOG, hashtag TTOG. Anyone ever heard of that hashtag? No, it stands for Teachers Throw Out Grades. And so I found an article, a blog article, called The Problem with Letter Grades in School. And I tweeted that because I found it fascinating and insightful and hashtagged it 